uh, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can listen me to me uh, in good conditions. My name is Francois Berger. I'm the executive director for LTIIA, and on behalf of Carbon4, LTIA, Guggenheim, and Meridiam, I welcome you to this uh, webinar <coughs> uh, on uh, climate challenges and risk and opportunities for infrastructure investors. You've been very numerous to register, and that's a very uh, <laughs> uh, satisfactory uh, thought that as citizens, consumers, uh, or investors, we're all on the cusp of a fundamental shift in the way we live, travel, work, and consume. <laughs> this is because we're now entering a period of rapid climate change, <laughs> a potentially existential challenge for, for mankind. Um, in this respect, the last few years, since 2015, Paris Agreement have seen a growing awareness uh, that climate change is happening here and now and needs to be better understood and monitored <laughs> in order to be managed, mitigated, and eventually addressed adequately. There's not much time left. Um, more slack uh, left due to the high inertia of already uh, emitted greenhouse gases uh, that will, uh, to, to some degree, already condition the, the evolution over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. And we may already be off track the required trajectory specified by the uh, Paris support. <laughs> so um, we, we definitely need to act quickly and now. Uh, in that respect, infrastructure is clearly at the heart of <coughs> uh, the climate change challenge. And conversely, there's probably no single more uh, relevant issue for infrastructure investors. Uh, it's important that long-term investors show the way forward and demonstrate their corporate citizenship uh, in this regard. <coughs> and we believe it's uh, it's possible to achieve better resilience and long-term visibility while uh, avoiding or minimizing the risk of stranded assets. So <clears throat> there are ways to, to manage this challenge. And at the same time, we should see it as a uh, huge opportunity for infrastructure investors, both in terms of dollar amounts. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's probably... Uh, and, uh, uh, decarbonization together with digitalization or decentralization is one of the three Ds that will shape the future of infrastructure. And at the same time, it offers investors with an opportunity to improve the image of private sector at a time where there are growing challenges from the civil society and public opinion uh, <coughs> regarding uh, private sector participation on infrastructure. So lots of opportunities, <laughs> uh, lot of think tank uh, that already uh, are uh, covering macro issues. Uh, one can think of uh, multilateral development banks, the task force on uh, uh, climate related financial disclosure, the uh, <coughs> uh, carbon disclosure projects, the IT climate, but less resources at a practical and operational level at the uh, asset or portfolio level. There's a, definitely a need for a methodological compass uh, to guide strategies and portfolio allocation. And this is why Carbon4, uh, LTIA, the Long-Term Infrastructure Investor Association, together with some of its members, uh, Meridium and Guggenheim, have banded together to provide you with uh, insights and guidance on how best to incorporate climate change <coughs> for asset managers in their asset selection, portfolio management, and more broadly align uh, it with that two degrees uh, <coughs> trajectory and how to check risk and resilience of portfolio linked with energy transition and identify early potential uh, stranded assets. So we'll now uh, hand the floor over to Carbon4 for a 10 minutes presentation on the two degrees infra challenge methodology. Then we'll have um, uh, Guggenheim and Meridiam provide their views, testimony, and refer to case studies or initiatives taken to illustrate implementation issues <laughs> for this approach, trying to be as concrete as possible. 
and we'll keep the, the last half, 25 minutes, uh, to discuss questions from the uh, audience. So I would invite you uh, during the course of the presentation to start registering with questions on the chat that has been made available as part of the uh, website. <coughs> I reckon there's a lot to be discussed. Uh, we may not be able to treat all questions. If need be, uh, we might go for a subsequent similar webinar on the same theme in a few weeks' time to further explore this central and critical issues for infrastructures. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to, um, to Juliette uh, and, and Carbon4 uh, to start with their presentation. Over to you. Many thanks, Francois. Can every, everyone hear me well? Just some, okay. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So uh, my name is Juliette. I'm a manager at Carbon4, and we are really happy uh, to have organized this webinar in partnership with LTIIA on the topic of infrastructure and climate change, um, because we truly believe that this topic is going to become high on the agenda for both public and private actors, and not only for the financial uh, sector. Before discussing our topic of the day, a few words about Carbon4. Um, so we are the top French consulting firm on energy transition and climate related issues. Um, for the past 11 years, we have helped our partners and clients to integrate climate related risks and opportunities within the strategy to pave the way for both carbon neutrality and a resilient economy. And uh, since operation, we have worked with the financial sector uh, with dedicated tools to provide uh, both rigorous diagnostics uh, with carbon footprinting, climate risk screening, due diligence to analyze uh, the climate impact of businesses, market studies, et cetera, and to implement climate strategies for asset managers and asset owners. And just to finish, we um, cover with our services all asset classes we have created a special company which is named Carbon for Finance that provides climate data for the listed investment universe. And we also cover the non-listed sector and in particular infrastructure. So to enter the topic of the day, um, of course, as an investor or an asset manager, you can invest or finance several asset classes. And truly at Carbon4, we believe that infrastructure in particular are, has a special role considering climate issues. And originally we started working, for instance, with a French development agency to create their official impact tool to measure um, the global climate impact of all projects, the carbon footprints. And uh, we have continued uh, uh, throughout the years working with investors and asset managers to integrate uh, the climate challenges within their portfolio and within their investment strategy. And we, we really believe that now, uh, considering all the investment which is being redirected with, with, to, towards infrastructure, it is really a good moment um, to um, have a broader perspective on the climate challenges for this specific asset classes, which is infrastructure. So that's why we um, have made this report, which is going to be online uh, tomorrow in English. It is already online in French which covers all the climate related issues, uh, challenges and opportunities for infrastructure asset owners and managers. So I will, will of course send you the links after the presentation. So to begin um, more on uh, our topic of the day. So as you may know, there is a direct link between the amount of greenhouse gas we release in the atmosphere over the years and the climate crisis. It means that if we continue to emit as much as we do today and to increase our emissions throughout the year, we're going to severely affect our climate uh, with unprecedented consequences on uh, the human species as a whole and of course on its economy. And that is why uh, scientists have determined what we call the carbon budget. So this, this um, um, notion is really important, the carbon budget. It represents the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we are allowed to emit from now to keep climate change under control, to keep the climate crisis under control, meaning that um, the carbon budget, it, it's equal to the, to the trajectory of emissions to keep the global warming below two degrees before the end of the century. So if we work on the presentation on the slide that we are just presenting now, 
it corresponds to the blue line, the plus 10 degree line. And if you sum all the emissions, all the annual emissions uh, under this blue line, it corresponds to the carbon budget. Okay, this is very important for uh, what's going on after in our presentation. So as you can see in this slide, now the future is open. It means that we have several climate scenarios of, in the future, depending on how much we are able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. If we continue as we do today, we, a, we may end up in a world with global warming of plus five of plus six degrees. So it represents the extreme line, uh, the extreme orange line. And of course, this is the path that we're, we are on track today. We are, we are following this track. So this is, this is the, the worst track uh, possible. Um, and if we respect the carbon budget, as I said, if we en engage in the good trajectory, so it's the blue line, we could end in a world where the, climate, the global warming is limited to plus 1.5 or plus 2 degrees. And the only way we can do that is to reduce our annual emissions by 6%, which is, which is enormous, starting from 2020. And of course, stopping our emission means keeping oil, coal and gas in the ground and, not, and stopping um, burning fossil fuels. Okay? So we have this scenario, and so it means that for all economic players, you have two kinds of climate-related risks. Just you have two um, two, two diverse risks, and of course, these two risks, these two these two risks uh, would be uh, combined throughout the future. So at the extreme level, you have physical risks. So it's the risks. It's it's linked to the direct consequences of, of, of our changing climate. So, for instance, increase in temperatures, more droughts, sea level rise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, in a pl plus six degree world, physical risks will be uh, really severe. On the opposite side, if we keep to our carbon budget, so if we succeed in limiting uh, our emissions throughout the years, it means that. For all economic players, they could suffer from mitigation risks, transition risks. It's a risk coming from the transition towards a low carbon economy. So it means that we have a more stringent regulations, new technology coming on the market, and new carbon taxes, for instance. And of course, all players which are highly dependent on carbon will suffer from mitig mitigation risks, such as, for instance, coal power plants. Okay, so you have these two kinds of risks for all players now, uh, depend and, and the one or the other will be more severe depending on the scenario. Okay, but what we what we say at Carbon Four is that these two risks are very relevant for infrastructure for two main reasons. The first one is that infrastructure is concerned um, owing to its lifespan because when you build an infrastructure today. So if you consider, for instance, a road, an airport, or a power plant, you build it not only for one year, but you build it for 40 or even 100 years, okay? So when you decide to build a new infrastructure today, you create what we can call uh, locked-in emissions. So it's the CO2 emissions that the infrastructure will emit throughout its lifetime. So that's why uh, that, that's the first reason why infrastructure is really linked to climate change. It's because it is, it's a long-lasting asset and it will emit emissions throughout its lifetimes. Okay, so it's really important to understand that you, you don't only have to consider emissions today, but also through the, lines, the lifetime of the infrastructure. And the second reason is that infrastructures are physical assets. The revenue it generates depends on its physical integrity. So if infrastructure is sev are severely damaged, for instance, because of climate change consequences, then of course it can create uh, great financial losses. Okay, so that's the two reasons why infrastructure are really linked to, to climate change. So if we keep that in mind, uh, and I'm going to go to the next uh, slide, um, why do we have called this, our webinar the elephant in the room? And I will invite you to really consider um, the orange um, text line, which is written on, at the top of this slide. It's, the, it's a, a study from the International Energy Agency. It's, it says that existing infrastructures embed 95% of the carbon budget, budget to remain below two degrees. 
what it means is that if we stop building any infrastructure from now on, if you just consider the existing infrastructure and the emissions that will generate over the lifetime, we already consume our carbon budget to keep global warming below plus two degrees. That's why we call the elephant in the room, okay? So if you are an investor or an asset manager, it draws three simple conclusions. We will need to close some infrastructure before the end of, the, of, this, of their economic lifetime if we are serious about climate change, okay? So for instance, coal power plants, some will need to shut down, but even a very highly de carbon dependent infrastructure may be needed to close and to shut uh, before uh, its economical uh, lifetime. That's the first conclusion. The second conclusion is that if we decide to keep existing highly dependent on carbon infrastructure, then we need to uh, really um, improve the carbon performance, okay? Uh, so it means, for instance, for an airport, we need to reduce drastically CO2 emissions per traveling pe person. And the third conclusion is that all new investment uh, needs to be 100% aligned with a two-degree trajectory. And we need to work on these three pillars to build uh, the energy transition we need. And I will pass now the presentation to my colleague, uh, Alexandre Jolie. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm going to be quick, but just to illustrate what Juliette has said, we're going to take a business example, a specific case, airports. So you all know them because they are quite profitable and also very present in all your portfolios. But about climate change, the story is different. So we're going to look at the two risks. First one is about mitigation. You can see on the graph the forecast for air traffic growth. You can see on the left at the worldwide scale, according uh, scenarios, so low carbon scenarios from the International Energy Agency. And on the right, it's about Europe. You can see that from an, histor an historical trend of around 5% a year, we may reach a trend more about 2 to 3% at a worldwide scale and even close to 1% in Europe. So climate change, it's also here and now. Um, what you may have heard is, um, for instance, the shame of flying in uh, Sweden. The conclusion was in one year that the air traffic just declined by 5%. So it's already impacting your business revenues. You may also have heard about the kerosene tax, so saying that this uh, sector is not taxed as another one, even though it's one of the most polluting sector. So it's quite likely uh, to, to have a kerosene tax to, uh, to appear in the coming decades. So it's about the mitigation part. You also have the physical parts. So here you have two pictures. The first one is about heat waves uh, on airports. So when the, so you have the, the red uh, dots, uh, which means that the, the airports uh, corresponding are the most uh, impacted in the world. But the conclusion is that when temperatures are so intense in summer, the concrete and the tarmac starts to melt down. In that case, the planes can't land off, uh, can take off um, and land. So the business is just stopped. Second point is about uh, the fact that more than 25% of most frequently worldwide airports are located below two meters above sea level. So that flood, flooding is becoming more likely. And in that case, same conclusion as for it waves, the business stops. So in both cases, either mitigation or physical risk, the business is impacted and it's starting now. It's not just uh, uh, not necessarily a dream or an acme, but we are already experiencing it. I'm going to go very quick, but um, at Carbon4, what we believe for a finance player is to move forward three steps. First one is about understanding what is climate change, what is at stake. So it's rising awareness, training, measuring. Second step is about elaborating a strategy. So for that, you need to define an investment strategy for new assets. You also need to set 
to set sorry new carbon performance targets for existing assets and also integrating the physical parts once you've defined this you need to put it in place it's about due diligence as for carbon but also as business strategy because as we've seen climate is now part of the strategy of an asset you also need to put action plan to monitor the carbon performance of your assets over time. And there is also an aspect about reporting. We are working with several players according to maturity on each of these steps. I'm going to conclude very quickly. It's just about the twin infra uh, project, twin infra, uh, two infrastructure initiative. But uh, the idea is to answer to two main climate challenges. As an investor, how can I say that my portfolio is aligned to a true uh, two-degree tra uh, trajectory? For instance, if in my portfolio I have one airport and three wind farms, is this portfolio aligned with the two trajectory? I, am I serious about climate change? So that's the answer we are providing by developing a methodology and a tool. We are also answering the second question, the second risk, which is, how risky is my portfolio according to the typology of the assets, but also about the geography of my assets. So that's what we are uh, at the moment creating and developing. So, yes. so that's the conclusion about what we are working on at the moment answering these two climate change challenges. Uh, sorry. Yes, Francois, you want to... Take the lead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to, to thank Juliette and Alexandre for this uh, general presentation. We'll, we'll have the opportunity in a few moments to get a bit deeper into some of the uh, aspects or issues that you uh, mentioned synthetically. But right now, I suggest we uh, move over to uh, Jim Pass, uh, from, who's uh, joining us from the US, uh, uh, from Guggenheim uh, uh, Foundation. Jim, can you hear us? Uh, and, and please uh, feel free to go forward. Um, yes, as long as can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Jim. Okay, great. Well, okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you very much for um, participating today and from Guggenheim Investments. What I would like to do is briefly talk about our approach, um, not just about climate change, but also how we have focused on sustainability and how that applies to infrastructure. And just in light of time, what I'd like to do is go to slide three of my presentation where we talk about the funding gap that is focused on climate change. And from our perspective, it boils down to how do we attract more capital um, to the infrastructure space, not just working with um, the public sector, but also getting the private sector involved, especially um, you know, in North America and, and throughout the world. There's a tremendous amount of cash on the sidelines, as we all know, and they're looking to get involved in hard assets um, you know, that are somewhat unique and not strongly correlated to different aspects, to different other investment classes. And with the, um, the, the, really the growing awareness of climate change and the Paris Accords and so forth, what we have done is we've taken a step back and really wanted to design a framework on how we can attract um, and really analyze in, um, in infrastructure investments that um, to put capital to work. And Guggenheim Partners works with insurance companies, pension funds, and sovereign wealth funds as an ins institutional investor. And simply put, if something can be measured, um, it can be managed. So when you, whether it's climate um, impact or changes in the climate or various aspects of sustainability, we have designed the sustainable quotient, which is on page four, and very comparable to how I think we all do our financial returns. We obviously have to have a project that is going to um, offer our clients and um, preserve the capital with rates of return that are adjusted for risk reward in the light of the environment, um, good governance, and the social impact. And so what we've done is we have a metrics for each of the quadrants that I described, and it can be applied for greenfield projects as well as brownfield. 
Um, typically, we like to get involved as early as possible when it's a greenfield project. Um, but obviously, this 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 concept um, is really trying to apply um, the traditional financial analysis from a balance sheet perspective, from um, the generation of income and so forth, and design a program or design a project that also takes into consideration, um, you know, how one is going to manage the program or manage the project. Um, are we respecting um, really the natural capital that is offered to us an infrastructure asset, as well as when we talk about the social impact, um, we like to focus on really all the stakeholders involved in a project. So not just the off takers, but also the indigenous people where a project may be or the local community. And so when you look at the quotient um, taking a step back, it's about financial capital, human capital, and ultimately um, natural capital. And I think it's important that when we're looking at climate um, and the impact of climate change, it all um, impacts each one of those because it's gonna add cost. Um, and that is something that we're working through, but it's also important to realize that if we de design a project um, you know, during a greenfield phase, our goal and our thought is that increased value engineering will then defer or delay deferred maintenance. Um, and so we're not raising more equity um, you know, right after a project comes online or so forth. So we really wanna take much more a comprehensive approach and take into consideration um, you know, the SDGs, the climate change that we're talking about here and put that into on our investment process. And one of our steps doing this was last summer working with the WWF, um, we commissioned a report um, that was done by Stanford University, that is um, the cover shot is on page five. And I don't think this is really a surprise for um, anybody on the call, but when you're measuring sustainability or you're measuring the impact of climate change, um, there's a lot of um, standards that are out there. And rather than converging right now, they're still diverging. And we feel that over the next probably three to five years, there definitely will be a consolidation of um, assessments on how an infrastructure asset in particular is reviewed. Um, and we are eagerly awaiting to apply projects um, on a global basis um, to the different standards that are out there. And we're trying to um, you know, commission a report that we're going to compare two greenfield projects and two brownfield projects to the various standards. And then based upon that analysis, it is our goal to deploy more capital in the infrastructure space using the results of that study and combining that with our sustainable quotient so then we can actually design a strategy um, that's focusing not just on the financial return, but also measuring um, you know, the impact on the climate, the impact on the, the natural capital and so forth, as well as what happens to the human capital where a project is. And one of the key aspects of our program at Guggenheim um, is, is, is really we value the um, really partners in this process. And listed on page six are various partners that we're working with um, as we have refined and, and, and keep on um, evolving the sustainable quotient. Um, because I, I think it's important to realize that infrastructure as itself is an evolving asset class um, you know, definitely in the United States from an equity perspective. And so we're trying to, um, you know, make sure that our process and our views of projects evolve with it. And I think, um, you know, with the explosion of green bonds, um, you know, with the SDGs really 2020 um, was coming up and, um, you know, with the, um, the high public, high profile public forum with the UN, there's just a tremendous amount of momentum that, climate is just one aspect, but everything is getting more and more visible and is definitely in the forefront. So we value partnerships on helping us, um, you know, move this forward. But um, in, in really our light time of schedule, I thought that that's kind of my remarks and I'll hand it back to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Jim. We'll, we'll come back in a moment on some uh, of the issues. Thanks for, for already for highlighting the need to have a sort of a across the aisle uh, transversal approach as much as possible through partnering in order to push and promote uh, forward this uh, uh, key agenda. Now, let me uh, turn to, uh, to, to Meridian, who's represented by Jeanette Bordeaux here, who will uh, tell us about the uh, specific approach that's already been rolled out and implemented uh, uh, on some of uh, Meridian's project. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, François, are you on two computers? Yes, we are. Okay, because you need, if Jeanette is talking, she needs we... to open her mic and you need to shut down yours because otherwise it will echo like this. But if you shut down your mic and she opens hers, it, will, it should work. Okay. Then... Uh, yeah. Hello everyone. Hello, everyone. Okay. Maybe maybe you can try uh, getting your sound uh, um, going out of your uh, computers, François. François. But are you are you on, on two separate computers or are you, are you using the same? No, that that that's fine, uh, Juliette. I'm using. Uh, oh, it's working uh, now. François. Yes. Perfect. Great. Okay. So, hello everyone. Sorry for the the the, the, the bad noise. Um, so, uh, I'm. I think that um, many of you already, of course, know uh, Meridian, but uh, it's important to us that uh, that maybe we. We'll, I'll come back to some of the characteristics of Meridian um, because it 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 uh, it's a. Uh, it explains why we do things the way we do. Uh, and just a, as a reminder, um, uh, Merizem is a private investment fund uh, specializing in uh, long-term investment in infrastructures. Uh, and for us, long-term means, uh, you know, between 20 and 30 years in general, uh, many uh, investments are greenfield uh, projects. Uh, so, um, just a second, we we have technical difficulties here. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so we'll. Uh, can 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 you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, Jeanette. Very well. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so, because of our uh, business model, the, the fact that we do long time, uh, long long term investment, uh, greenfield projects, uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure as well, uh, it's important to us that we manage uh, uh, climate risks um, because you know, like resilience is, is has been uh, uh, the. Uh, at the heart of our preoccupations, of our uh, concerns for uh, since since uh, Minism was created, and for us resilient, resilience means uh, you know is the project justified? So essentiality, uh, is it adaptable, and how anchored it, it is in a more comprehensive uh, resilience strategy? So these are the first things that we look at when we uh when uh, uh, an investment opportunity is presented to us so our concern about uh about resilience and about climate risk starts where when we uh we, we start looking at a, an opportunity um maybe it, next uh, slide please 
So, um, you know, and, and we have a, like a comprehensive approach uh, that includes uh, ESG uh, risk management, uh, analysis of uh, our contribution to the sustainable development goals, and uh, management of climate risks. And, and we call it the impact-oriented business approach. But, you know, to make it short, what it all means is, uh, that, you know, that we uh, have developed a set of uh, procedures and tools that help us manage those issues and optimize the, the positive impacts of our investments. Um, now, you know, on, on that page, what, what you see are the benefits for Metizem to have such a, a comprehensive approach. But I think that what needs to be rem rem remembered is the fact that it, you know, the first thing for us is that it helps us understand what these risks are and, and have a common understanding of what needs to be done to manage these risks over time. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just to, you know, uh, to explain um, how we uh, manage these, uh, these uh, concerns within the investment process, but the asset management process as well, I think that the most important thing to remember is the fact that it's the investment teams themselves that, that, have, that, that are, have the responsibility to, uh, uh, to assess and analyze the ESG risks, including the climate risks. Uh, so it's not something that it's not a function outside the investment process uh, where people would and, and, and ESG specialists would would look at the you know how how this uh, these issues have been looked at. It's more uh, a part of the the investment team. Um, uh, job to uh, to address these issues and to do what it takes to uh, manage these issues properly and to develop a, a proper ESG, including climate risk strategy, and to make sure that these measures that have been identified during the investment process and this 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 strategy to manage these risks will be passed through uh, to the asset management team when uh, the project or the investment becomes a, an asset within a, a, a certain portfolio. Uh, and during the asset management process, the risks will keep being monitored. And, and again, we have a very hands-on approach on asset management as we uh, are always represented, we have always board members uh, within the, the project company. So again, it's the responsibility of the Mehidzem uh, representative to make sure that, uh, that these information are, um, uh, are, are uh, collected and, uh, and, and, um, and, and shared with, uh, with the, the, the other partners and with the Mehidzem uh, management. So if we look at in more details at the ESG and SDG approach, uh, we have um, um, just to to uh, to note that our uh, ESG climate risk management and SDG impact procedures are uh, embedded in our certified ISO 9001 system. So that means that you know it 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 makes uh, makes it official for everyone and for the investment teams and the asset management teams to that to to be responsible and to take ownership of this process as part of their uh, the work to develop a project and to manage a, a, a particular project um, so for the investment uh, um, uh, for, for the investment process, we have a, a set of uh, tools and, and, and procedures where we look at ESG risks, of course, and we look as well, uh, you know, including the climate risk. Um, but if we uh, focus on climate, we, we will... Oh, I, I, I'm told that I have to <laughs> accelerate. So um, we, uh, we have like... A, 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 um, a proper, propriety uh, uh, methodology that 
that was developed with Kanban 4 uh, to help us uh, analyze very early in the Pro, the development process, the energy, carbon, and climate risk of a particular uh, uh, investment opportunity. We also uh, do, of course, uh, annual ESG performance of all assets. And uh, when we reach financial close, we will do a detailed carbon footprint analysis of each new asset in a portfolio. Uh, again, based on a, you know, a methodology that was developed with Carbon for um, that, that is consistent with the Proparco's approach. We have also our tailor-made methodology to assess contribution uh, of each uh, asset to uh, to in terms of uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, this methodology was developed uh, last year uh, with the help of a consultant, and uh, it's based on the UN uh, SDGs referential. Although it's uh, you know it it was adapted to um, to uh, Meridian's uh, business model and uh, it gives results that are that are uh, contextualized and that that help us um, you know manage in in the long term our assets and uh, well I won't I won't spend too much time on this but we have uh, been involved in the of course, in the two infra initiative challenge initiative with Carbon4 and uh, our partners, uh, uh, our other uh, investors and, and organizations partnering in, in this initiative. Uh, another example, just and, and I'll, I'll uh, finish with this: an example of uh, the you know detailed studies that we uh, we uh, have uh, sponsored or. or um, uh, conducted uh, recently on climate change uh, issues uh, with Carbon4 is uh, the Black Pellet uh, project. Uh, this is a biomass cogeneration plant and pellets production facility. Uh, and it, you know, like in, in short, uh, you, you have a few words on the project itself, but in short, it allows the coal-fired power plant to transition to biomass. But the idea with this uh, specific study was to uh, evaluate the impact of climate change on, on the business model of this asset uh, in terms of uh, physical and transition risks. Be, you know, the forest being the, the, you know, the, the biggest part of our supply chain. So we wanted to know what, what's going to happen in, in, in the long term uh, with this uh, this this um, this raw material and how will our project impact the the forest? And it ended up being a very interesting uh, study with with uh, very pr promising uh, results. Uh, you know where uh, it was shown that the 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 productivity of the forest is actually increasing. Uh, can increase with the with this project, and uh, other co-benefits would be, uh, for instance, uh, a better um, uh, protection against uh, epidemics for the for the forest, for instance. So you know, it, the climate risk, uh, climate rela related issues, can also become a very good way to first choose your your investment opportunities but to manage in the long term the the assets and um, you know make the right decision at the right time so I'll, I'll you know i think that i spoke too too long already so i'll let louis uh, francois sorry uh continue thank you very much uh, Jeanette. so with, with that i think we can move now to the uh, question and audience uh, <coughs> uh, stage and we have two um, uh, sort of technical questions to start with. Uh, let me pick on the first one, which is um, uh, <coughs> uh, whether the, uh, the, the GHG, the CO2 emissions we were talking about in the initial stage of the presentation by Carbon4 were gross on net of the uh, growing, even though it's still a uh, limited uh, dimension uh, linked with carbon wells, the capacity to absorb uh, some of the uh, carbon uh, emissions. So that, that's a question that's directly related with a broader question, which is how do you measure uh, carbon footprints 
uh, for your portfolio. And I, I'd like maybe to uh, to 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 <laughs> build on, on this uh, broader dimension to ask. Uh, our uh, participants, maybe starting with Carbon4, uh, Alexandre and Juliette, uh, <coughs> what perimeter uh, do you take into consideration when you try to assess the carbon footprint of a particular uh, asset? Uh, you, you, you mentioned the fact that you needed to incorporate the supply chain. How far back do you go in, in terms of uh, factoring in the supply chain? Do you have different perimeters when it comes to construction and operating levels? Uh, <laughs> stages. We, we've seen that this is a, a potentially very rich uh, dimension as illustrated by the Black Pellets uh, uh, case that uh, Chinet just mentioned. So maybe first of all, it, it's a quick uh, uh, broad technical uh, response on, on what's the right level to uh, assess the carbon footprint for a particular uh, asset, uh, carbon four. Yes, many thanks, François. So um, to answer the two questions. So first, Philippe, uh, regarding your question. So when you see uh, the scenarios built by the IPCC to um, provide scenarios uh, that respect the carbon budgets, so that are aligned with a plus two degree trajectory, so it's net emissions. So it takes into account both uh, the sources, so the induced emissions and the sinks. And um, so that's why uh, we are all aiming to cut towards carbon neutrality, is that uh, all the remaining uh, induced emissions at the end of the century uh, must be uh, compensated with uh, increased carbon sinks and mostly uh, biogenic carbon sinks. So mostly the forest, the land, and also some um, uh, coastal um, projects linked to the, to, the, to the marine environment. Okay, so that's for the first question. And the second question, thank you, François, very much. Um, so how do we do carbon footprint? And, and by the way, one of our founders, Jean-Marc Jancovici, has created the carbon uh, footprinting methodology that, that has been taken uh, by the GSG protocol um, at the end. Uh, so for a project, it's really important to apprehend uh, the, the carbon risks and opportunities throughout the whole value chain and throughout the whole life, lifetime of a project. So there is three different steps that we consider, three different phases. The first one is the construction. Okay, so everything related to the materials um, that are uh, being used to, to build the infrastructure and the energy uh, used to, to, for, for, the, for the works. And for instance, when you are building a metro, for instance, or a subway, it's very important to take into consideration the energy used uh, to build underground uh, subway, okay, because it is a lot, actually, it can be a lot. Um, then you take into account all emissions linked to the operational phase and maintenance. So, uh, for instance, if I consider, I don't know, a, a highway, it will be all the emissions related to the light, to the, to the lights uh, in the roads, okay, so it's, it's, not, it's not a lot <laughs> for a highway. And, of course, you also have to consider uh, the use phase, of an infrastructure. So if I take the example again of a highway, uh, it will be all the fuels uh, which is burned by the cars which is uh, going on uh, the, the, the highway. Okay, and it's the same for an airport, for instance. If I consider the operational uh, emissions, I would consider, for instance, the energy consumed by the buildings of the airport. And if I consider the use phase, of course, I will consider um, the emissions linked to the, to the flights. And just to, to add on that, um, of course, it's important to um, provide standards in order to say which emission sources you take into consideration and which emission sources you don't take into consideration. And that is being quite uh, standardized right now. For instance, for airports, you consider uh, for the use phase only emissions associated with landing and takeoff. Okay, so it's under 3,000 uh, miles uh, of the airport. So it, it's quite standardized and it really enables to, to consider um, the whole um, climate risks and opportunities of throughout the lifetime because uh, you remember what we say at the beginning of our presentation, uh, it's important to consider the, the emissions locked in uh, throughout the whole lifetime of an infrastructure to consider if 
it is compatible or not with uh, the carbon budget at the global level. Sorry, I was I was a bit long. <laughs> Uh, th thank, thank you very much, Judith, and good to see that indeed we already have uh, the benefit of uh, more or less harmonized standards uh, when it comes to uh, assessing uh, emissions to uh, uh, build the, uh, the carbon footprint of a particular asset. So uh, unlike sustainability standards, where Jim reminded us that there are still divergent uh, views or interpretation or, or accounting reporting standards that need to uh, speak to each other and, and gradually converge in this technical field we, we seem to be already there in terms of uh, having uh, agreed upon uh, a set of homogeneous standards just a quick precision uh, uh, Juliet so you, you mentioned the, the the carbon footprint both at the uh, construction stage and operating stage I, I assume you would also take into account even though it might be more discounted in socio-economic terms the impact linked to the decommissioning of the uh, infrastructure at the end of its economic life is it something that's already been uh, factored in yes we t take it into account even if it depends actually on the asset but uh, clearly uh, it's a uh, last step that we we forgot to mention but it's taken into account and for for instance uh, you can take the for uh, the solar panels Recycling is taking into account the scenario at the end of the lifetime of the panels, it's recycled. And, yeah, and, and as you say, of course, this would be uh, widely varying, uh, I guess, uh, uh, when whenever you talk about a road or a, a, a particular technological asset that might have a, a much uh, shorter uh, economic life. Um, now, switching maybe about a more sort of a <laughs> organizational or process oriented question. Uh, uh, Jeanette reminded us that uh, at Meridian they have uh, sort of incorporated the, uh, the, the the climate change screening and uh, technical due diligence into the investment teams. It's not uh, sort of a contracted out to some kind of external uh, due diligence uh, <coughs> specialist. Uh, uh, do, do you have any idea, uh, Juliet? And this would also uh, uh, sort of uh, be for you, uh, Jim, of the. Uh, impact uh, that uh, incorporating this climate change dimension early on has on the uh, organization or the structure and the uh, incremental cost it may represent in the first uh, in the first stage obviously the idea is to uh, to uh, <laughs> uh, sort of get a, a payback in terms of increased resilience and uh, better alignment with uh, sustainable development goals, but uh, any idea of how much it costs in the short term and how it affects or uh, impacts the, uh, the structure or the organization of the team and the processes? Um, well, uh, to, to be honest, I cannot give you like a, like a certain percentage and, you know, a, a, as an average to uh, any deal that, you know, that will go to evaluating the ESG risk and, and, and managing climate risk. However, um, you know, if, if we factor it in, of course, when we decide to develop a project and uh, we factor this, this extensive work that we have to do uh, in the financial model that we're developing. And so if it doesn't make sense financially for the project because of you know the, the specific ESG measures that we have to put in place, including uh, measures to, uh, to manage or to deal with climate risks, then that means that the, the, the project will not be profitable anyway. So, you know, someone asked me when I, I do a training for, for the investment teams, um, you know, uh, you know, it, is it worth doing it or, you know, how much does it cost? And I said, well, I cannot give you the number, but I, I can tell you that if we don't, we, we cannot really afford not to do it. And this is the case for me and Jam, of course. And, and of course, when we, uh, we, we developed the right ESG strategy and, and the, the right climate risk strategy, the cost will eventually be less in the long term because you don't have to adapt something that is already built, which is much, uh, much more space. difficult yeah, more than, than to plan something uh, you know, from the beginning the right way. 
if I may um, chime in here, I mean, I think that that's really the, the approach that Guggenheim is taking. And I think that's really where infrastructure is heading, to be honest, is that there's going to be more time designing projects um, up front than um, really building a bridge to build the bridge. And I think they're going to take we're taking into um, design technology and you know, as I mentioned earlier, natural capital and human capital. And I think this evolution um, is just beginning. And I think we're beginning to see, and, and, and really, I mean, the, the best example for all of us is, is to focus on the green bonds, um, you know, or, or leads, you know, really the, the real estate um, standard that buildings can be designed to be green, and then they have different standards and different m plateaus. I think infrastructure assets will have the same thing um, regarding their carbon footprint. Um, you know, what is their um, cost of deferred maintenance or what will happen to um, timber, the natural resources? What happens if more cars are, le are electric rather than running on fossil fuels? Um, th this is going to keep on changing and what we're doing today probably will look rather different um, two, three, five years from the road, down the road, but but ultimately it still has to produce a financial return um, for institutional money to get, um, you know, to, to be deployed. And so to answer your question, I think the cost, um, whether it's measured up front or different construction equity periods or hold periods or different tenors um, will all impact our returns. But what we're seeing and really what our focus is, is that spending a little bit more money today, whether it's 10%, 20%, whatever that number may be, will enhance the returns substantially when you're out five years or 10 years so that you're not having to deploy um, or you know, modify your project. And I think we've seen that um, in airports, we've seen that in toll roads, we've seen that in wastewater treatments, um, as well as, you know, all different types of power, because ultimately it's extremely expensive to retrofit a natural gas or, excuse me, a coal power plant to natural gas um, or to, you know, modify different ways to collect tolls on a toll road is just another example that, you know, where technology can be measured. So climate change is just beginning. Um, and I think really what we're trying to do, and I think really what really what the SDGs are forcing the issue, is we have to be much more forward thinking um, when we're designing a project. And whether we're working with development banks um, or thinking about what happens if you dam a river, um, you know, a very part, very north part of the river, what happens to the individuals and the villages below, um, and not just in carbon footprint issues, but really is sustainable. And, and I think we, they, they definitely have to come together. It's very similar. Um, what we feel is that the blue economy and the green economy um, really should just be one. Um, and, and I think when you focus on that, um, that's where we are. Th th thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, and Andy, I think we could probably sum this up by saying uh, you can do uh, the, the, the right thing while doing a smart thing. It's better to uh, invest time and resources early on rather than having a need to retrofit uh, at last moment at, at, at considerably higher expense. Uh, I'm turning now to Juliette. We, we've almost reached the end of our uh, one hour uh, time slot. Do we still have time for one last question? Do you believe? Yes, 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 of course, with pleasure. Okay. Th then I'd like to ask our uh, <laughs> practitioners, uh, Jeanette and, uh, and Jim, if uh, uh, in implementing their respective methodologies, whether it's sustainable quotient or the specific uh, uh, SDG link methodology that uh, Jeanette told us about for Meridian, uh, has it already led in practice to uh, Deselecting some uh, sub asset sectors, uh, <coughs> uh, or, or, or maybe even in the ones you invested earlier on. I mean, the uh, program has been set up 15 years ago uh, now, almost uh, at a time when the SDG and climate change were not as prevalent as they are now. When you look back at this portfolio and you apply the new sort of screening methodology, would that potentially lead you to uh, de divest or, 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 or get? out of some of your earlier investments, Jeanette? 
Um, well, of course, for us, since since we invest for a very long uh, period of time, uh, you know, it, it, it's we haven't haven't reached uh, the end of an investment yet. Um, however, I can say that some of our uh, investment opportunities that we look at, we we uh, we have in the past decided to uh, either, you know. Forget about it uh, and, 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 and pass, pass, you know, pass on, on, on a certain opportunity, or to uh, to actually modify the project enough that you know to downsize it because of uh, of the, the 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 impacts it had on on the environment or the social uh, or the community. So we will modify the project then to make it uh, uh, more resilient and more in line with what the community and uh, the environment uh, is, is all about. So, you know, it's, it's more in terms of integration and implementation within in, in its, in its environment. And of course, at the same time, I'm not saying that we're forgetting about the financial or commercial aspect of the, of the deal but, and the investment, but you know, we, we look at everything and, uh, you know, I have a, a, an example where um, we're building a, um, a power plant, a hydro power plant in Africa and we downsized it we, uh, of about 50% its capacity because, uh, you know, we felt that it, it was needed to manage uh, the environmental impacts that was created uh, on the uh, on its surrounding okay so if i understand well the, the the type of methodology you have developed has now uh, started to be implemented not just for new assets considered for greenfield investment but all existing assets in your portfolio to try and align more with the uh, currently prevalent standards and uh, objectives and this can effectively uh, <coughs> sort of, uh, Generate the kind of critical reforms that you were uh, alluding to. Yes, uh, and, and and of course, you know the the assets that we have in our portfolio for more than ten years, they have been in operation, and and you know you cannot change drastically what the the asset is unless it's needed, of course. But uh, the idea is to monitor the performance of this asset and see how we can improve it. And you know if 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 it's needed, then you know we'll develop a, a, a more aggressive strategy to uh, to enhance or to improve the the, the the asset and its performance in terms of uh, of uh, ESG and SD contribution to the sustainable development goals, and, uh, and 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 see how we can make it evolve. Okay, I, I'm afraid we're definitely running out of time right now. We, I, I reckon there are some uh, uh, questions in the chat that we won't be able to uh, answer, at least orally now. We'll uh, come back to the, uh, <laughs> the people who uh, ask those questions uh, and respond to them uh, a, a, in a, a written form. And we may uh, very well, as I uh, alluded to uh, by uh, when opening this uh, webinar, uh, reschedule uh, another session on the same theme and uh, in, in the, the, <coughs> the coming weeks and months, uh, uh, based on the uh, strong interest uh, this seems to generate. So please join me in thanking uh, all the participants, uh, Juliette and Alexandre on uh, Carbon4, the organizers uh, uh, of the webinar, uh, Jeanette and Jim, uh, respectively, from Meridian and uh, Guggenheim. And we were very happy at LTIA to be a sort of a facilitator uh, for this uh, type of webinar. Uh, we, we hope to continue exchanging with you on this uh, critical dimension of infrastructure going forward. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to everyone. We will send you a, um, a link with di different information at the end of this webinar. We will send you a, um, a conclusion mail. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.